climate and environmental crisis is rooted in an economic model that exploits people and planet, while increasing inequalities and violence. States and corporations repress people fighting for access to natural resources, indigenous people and ethnic minorities, rural women and many others. However, movements around the world are resisting and creating solutions to local needs for land, water, food and energy. From Pacific Island feminists to the Black Mesa Water Coalition, frontline communities are building sustainable, long-term solutions. What if we replace profit with safety, well-being, justice, health and sustainability? What if people and planet were the center of our solutions? What if we listen to stories of resistance and connect with feminist and ancestral knowledge? It's time for change and the redistribution of wealth and resources. It's time to hear feminist voices and build solutions that benefit all people and the planet. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this learning lab on climate justice and human rights in the Pacific. The topic of this afternoon session is Pacific Defense of the Commons, Feminists Working for Gender, Climate Justice and Universal Human Rights. This session is co-organized by Diverse Voices in Action for Equality, Diva for Equality, and the Pacific Islands Climate Action Network, PCAN. Diva for Equality is a collective of Fiji women working with others for the advancement of universal human rights, economic, climate, and ecological justice, and sexual and gender justice. This South Feminist Collective works as part of the urban poor and rural communities in Fiji, and regionally and globally through community-led efforts. The Pacific Islands Climate Action Network is a network of over 130 member organizations in Kiribati, Tuvalu, Vanuatu, Solomon Islands, Fiji, and other Pacific Island countries. We work across the region with partners, allies to champion Pacific leadership on the climate crisis, amplify and support our members' work on the ground, and jointly develop climate policy ask for influencing national, regional, and international spaces. We hope that this session will be one of recipro reciprocated learning and that you will all be able to take away some useful learnings, strategies, and practical tools to advance and strengthen the work on inclusion, intersectionality in climate justice and resilient practice. And now I hand over to my co-moderator, Viva Tatawanga from Diva for Equality. Good afternoon, all. Uh, good afternoon from Lodala Beach in Suva, Fiji. Uh, from wherever you're tuning from, we welcome you to the session. Uh, without further ado, it's my uh, honorable task to take you through the session for this hour. So just before we get into it, I'm just going to do a bit of housekeeping uh, that we're going to go through the session and straight after the going through the session, I'm going to jump straight into the past short PowerPoint presentation from Diva and the work that we do. And straight after the PowerPoint, we're going to introduce our three panelists um, who will be sharing with us the experience of the work that they're doing and some of the concept that uh, feminists has been using for more than a decade uh, to really help move the work that we're all doing, the good work that we're doing around climate justice. And straight after that, we're going to have a, open a little room for question and answers or respond to some of the questions that will be popping up in the chat group. And straight after that, we'll we're hoping to have a little PIA, which is going to uh, give time for participants to really share like some of your key learnings from this one hour session. And well, let's hope we have time and straight after that, there'll be the end of our one hour session. So as Langi has stated, we hope that you will really um, feel you'll go away from this session 
feeling like you've learned or take away something useful for the work that you will be doing in the future and you're already doing on the ground things. So I think let's go straight into the PowerPoint. So Diva for Equality. Um, why one of the, before we came into the session we were, asked, uh, we were uh, brainstorming and we were trying to figure out like to personalize this, why we were doing this session. And for me, I shared to the group is, I have three kids who, uh, two small boys and a little girl, which is my namesake, I just also take on. And one of the reason why it's important to really have this kind of conversation and do the work that we are all doing is because of the future of our children. If it's the future of our children and also, you know, to better the, the system that we all thinking like it's failing us. So how do we then do, do the work to help us better those for our children, not just only for today, but also for our future generation. Let me just do the slide. I will just share with you the Diva vision. This is our vision. There is um, all women, all people, all human rights and social, economic, ecological and climate justice everywhere. If we are talking about climate change and we're not including everybody, then we have to really rethink about that because everybody, regardless of your sexual orientation, your status or your background, uh, your the background or your experience, climate uh, impacts really uh, also be about you. So the work that we're doing, we work from five work streams. Um, it's about uh, one is about universal human rights, always ensuring that the work and the approach that we're doing is about uh, the betterment of human rights and really access to full to the human rights of all and not just a particular group of people or network, but human rights for all. Workstream two is about strengthening linkages between gender, solidarity, economic, and climate and ecological justice. Hence why we've been part of this uh, session. And we thanks to also to PCAN really in the partnership. Workstream three is about transforming feminist activism and social gathering. Um, this is about building a movement and how we should build it, uh, how we can do it better together. Workstream four is about urgent response. How do we really balance the material and the structural work and making sure that as much as we're pushing for policy, uh, influencing policy, we're also doing the material work in you know, always uh, trying to respond to urgent needs when it arises. And Workstream five is just about maintaining and sustaining the organization, which we all know that if we don't maintain ourselves, how then we are expected to go out and do the work that we do. Uh, this, this is going to be the concept that our speakers is going to be sharing with the group. So I will not talk more on that, but you will hear from us in the next couple of minutes about how do we really take these concepts and practice it in the work that we do. Uh, Women Defend the Commons. So Diva came into this work with this through this network, which has started in 2014 and still going on. Later in the slides, you will see, see all the works uh, that we've been doing. But one of the things that's feminist that we always try and do is when you're talking about climate change, we should not just focus on the, con on the definition of climate change. Climate change is also about disaster response and ecological ju justice. How are we doing that? We need to be actually talking about mitigation, adaptation, and how are we really making use that technology is, you know, we are enforcing or we're pushing for technology that can meet the work that we're doing. And also the balancing, like I've mentioned earlier of the material and the structural work. So this needs to be acknowledged and this should be um, something that we are already practicing on the ground, which I'm sure we're already doing is balancing that as much as we're going into spaces and trying to influence policy and going into attending meetings in the global, in the regional spaces, we're also doing uh, linking it to the ground in how we are uh, responding to crisis and we, how we are doing uh, service provision and referrals when, it's, when we are required to do this. And these are just some of the work that we are already we are doing on the ground. Uh, as you can see, it's about human rights for all, recognizing, advancing, and protecting our human rights in all aspects, especially with climate change work. We all know that this is a, a right to live in an environment and a planet that is free from uh, fossil fuel that is, you know, really uh, for putting into the center is the well-being of every individual human beings. 
building base uh, organizing networks, it's always important to have the work that is connected to constituency and the people that, you know, the, as we always say, people is power. So how are we doing that? We're making sure that we are building and organizing uh, ourselves in the work that we're doing that really to amplify the voices that we're trying to uh, share. And these are just some of the photos that we, uh, through the Women Defend the Common in the beginning of the days in 2014, which it, through the, came out from Women Defend the Commons, came out from this regional meeting, which is about the Pacific Partnership of, to strengthen gender climate change and sustainable development. And through that work, what was really uh, visible was the lack of having a gender into the, in the whole analysis and argument of climate change and the lack of having women's voices included in these spaces. So one of the ongoing work that we're doing right now is through Women Defend the Commons. So these are some photos that we've been doing our annual meetings around the country from 2019 up until 2020. Gender and climate justice and disaster response that I've mentioned earlier, we cannot be siloing that we just wanna talk about climate change. We just wanna talk about, uh, see, we are just here for, uh, we talk about sea and talk about all the oceans and stuff. We have to find a way that it's all about this thing that sometimes it's about protecting our ecosystems. I uh, apologize for the photo, but this is a woman that is really trying to try and protect the kutta farming. And if you uh, have know about this uh, special kind of uh, farming, it's about this unique uh, mat that is uh, actually from my, uh, my, where I'm from, from Bua. So this is a specific woman out there trying to protect these ecosystems to make sure that they still can make kutta for them now and also for the future generation. And it's also about this like cyclone relief, also about women working together, really disrupting the uh, uh, field that is uh, male dominated. This is uh, Fiji Women in Construction Peer Support Group. They're really trying to do some material work in responding to renovating some homes and also putting back together some homes after disaster or cyclones. Um, I know Vika is on the call and this is a bridge that Vika, which, who is the focal point of our Fiji Women Builders, uh, can talk about the bridge and how they were able to influence the structure of uh, the village to make sure that they were able to go in as gender non-confirming people, women, and be part of these uh, uh, constructions that be part of building this bridge wearing the uh, three quarters. So that's something that we need to think about. We always think like our culture is a barrier and it can't be changed. But if this is able, if this is uh, able to be uh, done in a very uh, remote, in a maritime village, then I'm sure there's a chance for us to also influence or try and negotiate better in how we can really do the work without uh, discriminating or without keep focusing it on the issue that it's a tambu, it's a culture. There's always room for negotiation. We put this uh, slide specifically not about construction because this is not just about construction. It's about wash, pro it's about what? Rights to water and sanitation, it's a wash project. So, you know, having women to be living in rural areas or in urban poor areas without having proper water supply or don't even have a proper wash in their home or facility, that is something that we also need to look at if we really want to talk about uh, this work on climate justice. And being resilient, yes, we can say that it's about uh, being resilient and you know being okay, but let's not forget that even when we're being resilient, there's still we are going through the tunnel and what ever goes into the tunnel before we get out to the other end, there is suffering, there's emotions, there's all these things that we always have to think about. Linking the work into sexual and reproductive health and rights, always important. And this, this one, uh, this uh, work here that we're doing right now, this came out of the work that we're doing right now when we're reaching out to uh, some of the uh, uh, urgent requests that we've been receiving over the past two months. And you know, one of the things that we also need to look at is poverty. Yes, it's about we should, we are all thinking about disrupting the unfair system, accessing poverty, but we also need to acknowledge the fact that, you know, the, the solidarity networks that we're creating at the same time. We need to also 
lean on that uh, end more because that will then really help us keep destructing unfair system. And these are the work that I think we all, all of us has been doing is how are we making sure that the work that we're doing on the ground is also represented in these kind of spaces, not just about going in and influencing and sharing the work that we're doing, but really disrupting the place to make sure that we also have a chance to be ourselves in these kind of spaces and making sure that, you know, every individual from the work that we do are also included in the space. As you all know, most of the uh, communities that we work with, uh, they most of the we did this um, research, uh, the unjust, unequal, and it's available online. UUU report, and one of the uh, outcome from this uh, research, the data was saying that most of LBTI women in Fiji how they are unemployed, and for us, it's not just about giving them tools for them to go in do some income generating from the tools that they take on brush cutting and stuff. It's also getting them to understand the importance of looking after the environment, free schooling, providing free school for them to really, when you're not just being part of this because we are gifting you brush cutter so you can go and cut grass, but it's also you being part of a broader network, broader movement that's just, that's not just about sustaining yourself economically, but it's also linking it to other work like looking after environment and all that that we already do. Food security and sovereignty, um, we all, we cannot keep saying that we, keep, we should be resistant and should be, when people are really uh, going into, you know, like feeling the hunger and the poverty and so forth. But also food security is important because this is also climate uh, change issue. This is not just about NDC and all about all this other health and stuff, but we need to make sure that this is also about looking after environment so we can be able to use this land for food security. So for us, it's, that is also important. And how we are moving that forward, uh, we are building a woman run eco center, a place to transition the trial safe and organic agroecology uh, and local women's technology. So all the work that we're doing now really is going to be looping into something that is about transforming what we're doing on the ground to really a practical thing. And Farmerama Fiji Women's Agriculture Center is going to be something that we'll be uh, working on uh, in the process of finalizing all the things. So hopefully by the next time that people will be around and we're able to move around, you can drop a visit to our farm. Uh, organizing online too is very important. Diva is also part of this uh, campaign, online campaign. And this is about, you know, uh, communities of practice. Like how do we really make sure like regardless of where we're tuning from and there's restriction that we're not able to meet and stuff, are we still getting communities to participate in this kind of platform? So that's also some of the things that we're still doing. And these are some resources that will be shared on the chat. If you, but you know, you feel free to email us if you need some of these uh, resources. Diva 10 tips for grassroots organizing. One of the things that we recognize after doing this work for nine to 10 years is most of the women, most of the grassroots networks, they out there, but the lack of sharing the knowledge in how to start a, something like a network that can be sustainable, that can be a, a thing that runs for long is always a challenge. People know the structure, but how do we look after the structure so we can hold the work and also really push the work forward. So one of the things that we try and share with other women and other network is these 10 tips of uh, grassroots organizing. Uh, we have the South Feminist Manifesto. This is a commitment that Diva did with one of our sister organization partner with research, which I'm also part of, is creating a space for fe South Feminist young women that first time to attending a CSW and we all know how those kind of spaces can be very intimidating. So this was an outcome from one of those sessions that we actually hosted uh, in 2018, I might say, 2018 CSW in New York. So that's the end of our PowerPoint. I hope that's been helpful with you in understanding um, the work that we're doing because that will actually help set the scene for our panelists. Uh, so please, I will, without further ado, I will now give the space, the uh, platform, the floor to the panelists. Uh, we have Vika Kalokalo, who will be uh, sharing with us her concept of bodily autonomy. Vika, are you in? 
Vika, I will let allow the uh, panelists to introduce themselves briefly and let them get straight into the session. Thank you, Viva. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Vika Kalkalo, a Diva Management Collective member. Also, focal point for women defend the commons and uh, his women builders a peer support group. So um, I'm very thankful for today for a very interesting topic. Thank you, Viva, for uh, the nice presentation. Um, also, the weekend organizers. So for me, um, in this meeting, as a grassroots organizer, mobilizing LBT and families builder, being at the front line in the work that we do, being resilient is not easy. Women and people of all diverse, diversities face multiple challenges because we don't live single issue lives. Resilience is something that not everyone can master. What you told me is about the right to make decisions about your own body, without oppression and without interference, let alone decision about your own body. Even the thought of making a decision brought about fears, frustrations, mental stress and breakdown. Because we live in a society they're distracted by unjust, an unjust system that if you are not aligned with the system, you are not normal or dis disrespectful. Pacific women and people have faced the aftermath of numerous disasters and cyclones. Fiji alone has faced two to three consecutive cyclones and a pandemic with the first and second wave at present. Violence against women and girls has continued to increase. How can, we, how can we make decisions about socioeconomic, ecological, and climate justice if we can make decisions about our own body? To be resilient, we had our bodies violated, disowned by family, stigmatized, and discriminated. Women of all diversity prefer to stay in their half alone roof home during, during cyclones rather than going to evacuation centers. Even at evacuation centers, women, children, people of all diversity were abused and violated. The question to ask is, what does it take to be resilient? Therefore, equality has been creating safe spaces for grassroots women and gender non-binary people to organize and plan. The feminist accompaniment has made these grassroots women to be bold and firm when speaking about social, economic, ecological, and climate justice. Women Builders Group is already starting to disrupt this system, assisting a maritime village with building their working bridge for the elderly, for the women, for the children, especially for the whole village. Wearing shorts and construction outfit, this shows that there's flexibility in the system. If a great set of work has to be carried out, which benefit the whole village and communities. Young women have started to be represented in the village and council meetings. Resilience and access to basic needs such as HR, HR, EVOG services, food, housing, health, education, and employment is needed by many. We need to work together. Be an advocate in our own community at, at national level, regional, and global level. We need to connect the dots so that the work at the global level is also highlighted in the grassroots level. Thank you. Thank you, Vika. Can we ask um, Francis? Francis Tawake to take the floor. Can you hear me? Hello? Yes. Okay, yes, you sorry. can hear you. So thank you everyone. Um, um, uh, my name is Francis again. And uh, well, thank you Kado for that powerful message. Um, today I will speak on um, why inclusivity is important. 
when it comes to climate uh, resilience. Um, inclusivity is an action that is important in uh, building climate resilience in our community. When the word inclusiveness is featured on our reports, in our policies, in our action plans, we make sure that it reflects and um, effectively represent the intersectional needs of our people, our community, who should be the heart of any development and changes that we want to achieve. The ability to prepare for, recover from is very important in building our community resilience. Women, LBT and gender non-conforming people are typically more likely to be negatively affected by the, the impacts of climate change because of the lack of access to power and resources that is available around them. All women, LBT, single mothers, sex workers, and women-headed households, women living with disabilities and gender non-conforming people experience climate change differently from men because of gender inequalities. Patriarchy and con that continues around a community affecting women and every individual to adapt and be resilient in a certain way. Women play a critical role in response to climate change due to our local knowledge of leadership and sustainable resource management and leading sustainable practices in our household and community level. Women step up and look for assistance of resources in cleaning equipments for their village. LBT and grassroots women organize themselves to plant mangroves and clean up our shores. Mothers and single mothers help men set up COVID-19 checkpoints in our villages. Women came forward with a request for support in village dispensary. Women communicate their message through chants and play charts, which created the space for them to thrive and practice being open authentically that gives them the courage to feel more comfortable and speak confidently. Sex workers are moving back into their village to plant food and Nangona in order to sustain their livelihoods. Women living with disabilities have been organizing food distribution in their local communities and, are, and took part in recycling activities. Already these resilience actions are giving a clear link to women on the importance of safeguarding and connecting to our environment as frontline leaders in the environmental and climate justice areas of their work and most of all, look out for each other, sharing the ecosystem of care and why it is important in all women's personal growth. We can't be talking about inclusiveness when majority of our women are sitting for hours at our COVID-19 borders under the hot sun and rain trying to sell off their produce. We can't be talking about inclusiveness when majority of our women are sitting and majority of our LBT members are earning $5 per day when some of us are living in a fully air-conditioned air homes. We can't be talking about inclusiveness when majority of our women living with disabilities could not afford to buy urine catheters. Engaging all women and people despite of our ethnicity our disability, our sexual orientation throughout the disaster management cycle is imperative for the success of resilience building efforts. Climate resilience represents an opportunity to promote positive change towards gender equality and change and challenge historical patriarchy norms and practices. We have to redistribute our powers and resources, making sure that the poorest of the poorest are included and participating effectively. We appreciate what our government is doing at the moment, but more work needs to be done. We should be investing, we shouldn't be wasting our resources on things that does not matter to us. Invest in women's lives because this will increase resilience in our communities. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Francis, for a very powerful speech. I will now um, welcome Nolene. Nolene. You have the floor. Thanks very much. I'm Nolina Bolivo. I am the director of um, uh, Diva for Equality and a long time, um, I don't know, believer and worker in <laughs> grassroots action for um, human rights and, and justice um, and really resilience. Anyone who knows me knows that I've had a struggle 
um, on the on the with the word resilience. Um, and I think that's OK. You know, I think that we have to question the way that we use lots of words that we automatically talk about in development sector and in human rights. And for me, the, the issue of resilience is precisely what um, Francis and um, uh, Francis and Cardo and Viva have been talking about, um, which for us is about how do you really measure um, the amount of resilience you know, that, that a person, an individual person can have, that an individual household can demonstrate, and then how that's carried through into different institutions and all the parts of society. How is that demonstrated? Um, and, and so for us, we're, I guess we're, we have a healthy caution um, when we talk about issues of resilience. Um, and, and one of the things is that what we're trying to do today in this session is to really open up and say, there are so many wonderful tools that come from different sets of social movement work. And we want to share some of those tools. And one of the tools that I want to talk about is intersectionality. And so for anyone who's used um, you know, the term before, sometimes you take a look at a term and you go, oh my goodness, it's just a big word and it doesn't mean anything. Um, and, and really it does have a very deep meaning. It comes from the work of um, African-American feminists actually, who were doing work around race and gender and class and putting them all together and saying, it is how these systems of oppression and power intersect that really matter. How do they come together? Because that coming together has an impact in every hour, every day, every week, every month, and for a person's whole life. So that's really what we're talking about is who you are, all of your social categories, all of your identities, they say something into the world as you move through the world. You know, the kind of clothes you wear, the amount of money that you're spending in the economy, the amount of access that you have or don't have to the people with formal power, with traditional power, with informal power. And this has a huge determining factor on whether or not you are able to access food and water and sanitation and security on whether or not, if you're a lesbian like me, are you going to be able to walk through the world and not be harmed by violence? What we're talking about in intersectionality is saying every person who's in this session, every person around the world, you have so many different identities and they're all interlinked. So for instance, you might be a woman, for instance, who has a lot of formal uh, traditional power. You're a chief within a particular district, right? But at the same time, you come home every night and you might be beaten to an, within an inch of your life by your husband or your partner. At one and the same time, you are experiencing both privileges and oppression, both formal and informal, both public and private. And what feminists and others who work in this area are interested in doing is saying, let's not pretend that everybody experiences life and development in the same way, that everybody has citizenship available to them in the same way. It's not, we know this instinctually as people, but when we start to design policy, we suddenly forget that the people that we're dealing with are incredibly different to each other and that we have to design policy that works for all of us. And there's all these pretty phrases that we have right now in the sustainable development goals and others that say, leaving no one behind. Okay, then help us work with us to be able to design policies that are about resilience, that are about human rights, that are not just about because I look like you or I like you or I think you are a good moral person, or whatever other human things that labels that we put on each other, then suddenly you are disqualified from having the right to live a full and safe and happy life? No. So for us, that is where we are in the negotiation of power. That's what we've been doing for 10 years, is being really open and authentic with ourselves and with communities and saying, okay, let's talk resilience, but let's talk justice in the middle of that resilience. And in order to do that, we have to find new languages. We have to find new ways to be in the world with each other. Because let's face it, all those dark old systems, they're, they're the reason why we're in the big mess that we're in today, whether it's social, economic, or ecological. So we want to build a new kind of world where we are able to share these precious resources um, that we have both here in the Pacific and around the planet. 
um, because we have to work fast now, we have to accelerate. So that's why we with you all in this resilience work and sharing it from a feminist frame unashamedly and saying, it's not a question of whether you use the word feminist or you use the word gender justice. It's about whether you are serious about how development is available, how power is available or not to all of us who live in this world and how we treat each other, other species and the planet. So that's really what intersectionality is about. And we're gonna share some more resources with you on the chat and, and afterward on our Facebook page. So I'll pass back to Viva, thank you Viva. Thank you so much, Nalin. I'm just taking over the, the head from, from Viva. Um, and thank you for sharing those pearls of wisdom and insights about intersectionality. Um, and you know, intersectionality is both a lens for seeing the, the world of, of oppression and also a tool for eradicating uh, oppression and discrimination and stigma, invisibilization of certain minority groups and other vulnerable groups. And um, I'm going to pass on to our next speaker, who is Viva uh, uh, Tatawanga, also from, from Diva. Thank you, Viva. Thank you. Um, moderation head off. So I'm, I'm speaking as Diva Management Collective, uh, Viva Tatawanga. I've also been part of the Divas work for decade, uh, for ever since it started. So my end, the tools that I will be speaking on today is interlinkage. Uh, at some point, we kind of sense the fact that people, we get caught up with interlinkage and intersectionality, and we tend to um, play with them in a way that they, it's kind of the same when it's not. Um, so just to give a little bit background about interlinkage, interlinkage came out from the feminist work of Dawn, Development for Alternatives Over the New Era. So this work came out because we, uh, Don and other women's uh, families groups, things like we cannot be talking about a single issue and not thinking about all other issues that has an impact on the body of women. So for Diva for Equality, interlinkage approach is very important because when you have um, corporates, development agency who is taking up spaces, our spaces, and who are really starting to speak the language that we speak, we need to come up with better ways of uh, uh, strengthening our analysis. So we make sure that we are not just talking to ourselves, but we are also speaking that uh, kind of language. So for us in Diva for Equality, it's very important to make sure that we are talking about women, when you're talking about climate change, we're not just talking about it as an issue that is about the environment. We want to make sure that we are talking about how does the climate impacts, climate change effects really have an impact on women? How does it have an impact on our resources? How does it have an impact on our environment? And how does it really affect our social movements? Like how does this kind of uh, groups, specific groups, how the specific groups play a specific role in making sure that uh, we are really talking about climate justice and we are not just talking about it from our own agenda. So one of the one of the tools that we really kind of help the work that we are doing is using the interlinkage approach. The reason that this is very important is it does not uh, differentiates an issue away from on into a silo issue. It really links in all these issues that have uh, every every communities or every networks or even the people as individual as women as the uh, Francis have mentioned. We cannot be, keep talking about development. We cannot be talking about being inclusive and we are leaving other specific groups out. We cannot be talking about including leaving no one behind and we don't want to look into the issue of um, sex workers. We don't want to look at the issues of LGBTQI community. So how does this really imply the work that we do is interlinkage approach really kind of help you get into spaces where you 
normally I've been told that you cannot access it, that you are not allowed into the space. So if you use this approach of interlinkage, nobody can really shut you down because you're there, you know your stuff. You coming, you know, you know, you're the one experiencing the issue on the ground. You are the person that is on the ground and is facing all this inequality of being accessing services, of not being able to uh, access information, access the, uh, uh, the groups or even access spaces there which is about strategizing and making decision. All these spaces, if the working from a interlinkage approach kind of really help with getting you into those kind of spaces and really better the analysis and politics of the issues that you bring on the table. I think that's it for my bid. Um, I'll give it now to Lani to take us through the Q&A and perhaps we can have more time to respond to some of the questions that we have on the chat. Thank you so much, uh, Viva, for that. And uh, we are going to move on to the uh, question and answer sessions. And we've had some excellent questions coming in through uh, the chat. And um, I'll probably uh, pose the uh, first question and then uh, one of the speakers can, you know, feel free to come on mic and on screen to, to respond to that. And one of the questions that I see here is in one of the sessions earlier um, for the PRM, uh, there was some conversation that was talking about traditional knowledge and a panelist from PNG talked about how the change in language um, if, for example, refraining from the use of the word gender had encouraged men to be more involved in the change and training of women. And the question is, how do we practice this to ensure inclusive participation? Uh, I can I can Please. begin I can begin very quickly and then um so one of the one of the things that I, I watched some of that session and thank you it was a really useful session um one of the things that concerns me is the idea that um if 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 you don't use a certain word then the work will move better um and one of the one of the kind of counter arguments to that is at this particular point in time you are meeting people where they are. So that's fine, you know, like sometimes when you go into a space, you go in to connect with another human being. So you will use the language that is required in order to connect. That doesn't mean that your relationship doesn't evolve over time and that you're not able to speak about other things like gender justice or equality or women's empowerment or um, sexual and reproductive health and rights. Those conversations, that deepening comes about through relationships. And what I saw from that case study was not about just tossing out gender justice work. What I saw was people who are meeting communities where they are and having really good frank discussions and being able to work with them in that way. And what I saw, um, what I see every day, you really, is specific women like us who are trying to make those conversations with communities. Sometimes it's with men who really don't even want to they don't want to talk to us about this issue. So we have to find ways to work through those barriers. And sometimes that'll be a long period of work and then suddenly you get a breakthrough. Other times you have to work through different kinds of systems. All of us know that in small island complex societies, there are particular ways that we work in order to move the work through the system. But what DIVA does, the main thing we do is we never compromise what is at the heart of our set of feminist work. So I'm not talking about the work for anyone else. I'm talking about how we position our work. You saw our vision. If, if we are about truth and justice and authenticity and everyone being able to live a full, sustainable, safe life, then we have to be willing to have these difficult conversations with men. So I, I do hundreds of sessions a year. And the first question in every single session is always, always, I can guarantee, I don't even think there's been one session um, in, that doesn't start with what about men's rights or what about the men? And when you start to go into that and to talk to men about who it is who, who, are, who are the victims of rape 
And who are the who are the ones who are per perpetuating violence against women? When you look at the evidence and the statistics, then suddenly you see faces start to change. And if you don't enter the pain and the anger and you have a frank and honest discussion with people of all genders, you are much more likely to move to the next. And can I just say as a feminist, let's be clear. It's never going to be easy to ask people to give up their power so that others can have more power. That is never going to be an easy task. We always say in Diva, we are not knitting socks. This is really tough work. So if we are going to change the world, it is going to be diff difficult and we are going to have to think about language and tools and talking about how our community has changed over millennia. We've changed as specific people. So we get to decide. And certainly we know that we are willing to quickly leave behind the fact that we have the highest rates of violence against women and girls in the entire world. That has to be not about being Pacific, not about being a Pacific person. So if that has to change and that has to use the word gender, we will do that work to do that because we have to keep everyone safe and, and, um, and away from violence. That's our work. Yeah, thanks, Langi. Thank you, Nolene. Uh, Viva, would you like to add on there? Um... I think Nolene has given a good explanation okay. about the uh, responding to the questions and also uh, maybe just to add on is we in the 2020 decade and uh, we are not still caught up in the in the era of stoning and uh, age and stuff so you know if we are able to move with technology and we also should accept the changes as it comes and the changes should be accepted because it's for the betterment of everybody no changes is starting to come the, the fact that we want to be inclusive we have one of discuss about intersectionality, then we need to be real about that in accepting all that has to change within that. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Viva. We have another uh, question here um, and it goes, uh, thank you speakers. Any tips or experiences on how we can give a voice to, be inclusive of and ensure climate justice for LGBTQI people in rural, Pacific communities that cannot, for cultural or religious reasons, publicly identify as part of this group. Okay, um, I'll start us off and my colleagues can also join uh, to uh, add more. Well, I think for us, uh, for DIVA, we have nine, uh, nine active hubs around Fiji right now. We are still a Fiji focus. We haven't really tapped into building outside the region. But one of the ways that those strategies that we're using right now is Women Defend the Common is also inclusive of LGBTQI communities. It's not just about uh, cis women or women that is uh, only women that is working in their uh, villages in the society, but also the LGBTQI communities. We uh, LGBTQI communities have been part of this right from the beginning and they they still part of it till today. And also one of the ways that we've been doing it with the uh, uh, LGBTQI communities is making sure that when they come into the space, the space is actually provided where both sets of women that regardless of their backgrounds, regardless of sexual orientation, they are there because they are trying to, they're coming for same purpose, which is how to work better together to create an environment and save a planet that is for all of us and not, you know, not really about just, um, uh, what can you say? It's not just about uh, ticking the box and getting them involved in something and then they, Part, they're not part of the whole process and the organizing and stuff. So LGBTQ, we have uh, Women Defend the Commons, that is the network that is inclusive of everyone, uh, women and everyone. So that is one of the uh, strategy that I uh, know we can really easily loop into if you're tuning in from Fiji and I'll give it to the rest of the crew if they have other thoughts that uh, can also help with this question. Thank you. Thank you, Viva. We have um, another question here, and I'll probably ask you to uh, ask Vika to, to respond to this. 
and that is um, sex workers and climate justice. Can you elaborate further on that, please? Um, so climate justice for sex workers versus the traditional and spiritualism uh, as in, you know, uh, that is uh, evident in the, in the Pacific uh, cultures. Thank you, Lai. Um, yes, um, for, for these questions is, um, from, my, from my point, it's just linked to the, the previous question, sex workers, um, we have those that are straight women, also those that are LGBTQ. So for us, even um, uh, the, the gender question that was asked before, you know, when, you, when it comes to a very sensitive topic like LGBTQ, you know, in your organization, you also have your sister organizations and your allies and your accomplices. So if you feel that you, that you can't, can, can work on the, the sensitive issue, you, you reach out to your sister organization that, that is dealing with the, the, the issue and the, the group that can um, help you the, uh, what you're trying to find out from the group or, or about LGBTQ uh, people and also about SW and, and climate. So for Diva, what, what we have been doing, we, one of our policies do no harm. So if you think you the work is gonna bring harm to you and the, in the community, just uh, just let um, like uh, the organization like Diva to deal, and also we, we always have a, a lending hand help for like current um, the, the training with FNU was just on hold because of COVID. We we have so this access and for for all the staff of Fiji National University, uh, the, the, from the central to the north and to the west, and so it was uh, on hold. So the part of the topic is the so this access, and so if Diva is already reaching out through training. Uh, because uh, particularly most of the, the lecturers, most of the participants were men. So we were able to relay the message to the men and the men in, in, in the session, those are lecturers, you know, those are leaders of the family, those are husbands, those are brothers. So if we can get the message across during this research training with the university, we can also send, uh, help our men in our communities through training in the, in the community. The, the, the physical one has a, has a five year plan, a national action plan for preventing all violence against women and girls. DEVA is being part of that working group till to date. And our, our focus is the informal sector. So the informal sector is goes from informal settlements, women in the maritime, in the rural, in the urban, and also SW and also LGBT communities. SW and during the climate uh, and climate justice, you know, for us, we always, um, we always talking about about the, the, the physical the issue. We we didn't see the um, the effects on, on a human life. You know, we we tend to forget the effect on the body. As I as I was saying today, the body autonomy. So how can a sex a SW worker be safe in a community? That even every day she has been discriminated, she has been uh, abused, and they also been um, stigmatized in all their lives in every life. So imagine during a, a cyclone, how can she access every question set centers if the things uh, they are facing is is everyday life. So apart from going to evacuation centers, she chose to stay in the house. So how can we do justice um, when when our sisters in in the grassroots level are facing violence every day? How we connect the work that are we doing uh, at regional global level to the ground and how the work at the ground can be highlighted in the global level. So yes, thank you, Lang. That's, that's just my, um, my contribution today. Thank and you. Can I just uh, add very quickly, go ahead, um, sorry, very quickly, Langi, this is directly related. You know, a, a bottom line, if we're talking about resilience, and there was a great question earlier, which was how exactly do we define resilience? Huh? You can't have resilience as a person if your human rights are being abused every day. So for instance, if we are really serious about it in the Pacific, then those remaining seven countries and territories that still criminalize homosexuality, we have to get rid of those. A lot of those are very old laws that came to us from colonizers, and they've been got rid of in those colonial countries, and we're still holding on to them here in the Pacific. So we need to get rid of those and understand that human rights, universal human rights is a baseline for all of us. That's one thing. And then the second part of that is, 
how can we talk about resilience when women's bodies are just being, you know, are being violated every day when the, when the level of violence is so high. So let's tackle that as a top of the line issue for resilience work. And let's, let's tackle the fact that women do two to three times as much work around the region. Our work on unpaid care, domestic and, and, uh, and communal work by women is showing two to three times the amount of work. Women are exhausted. And we cannot do this other work on any other area of our lives when everybody is absolutely exhausted. And there's no one listening in this that can tell me that you don't know who's the first person in the household to wake up, the last to go to bed at night, and who's doing this work. So that is highly gendered, and we have to look at redistribution of care work within our societies. We really have to transform society. So that excellent question from PNG, should we identify social structures? Um, that reinforce bad, bad examples of gender? Yes, we should. We should work out those and remove them so that people can lead full and, and, and just and happy lives. And let's be real. This is not just happening in the Pacific. It's happening around the world. Um, there, are, there are things that are happening to us as people because of un, unfair, greedy, economic, macroeconomic systems as well. So it's not just about Pacific people doing these things. It's people of all colors from around the world and a very systemic set of injustices that we have to remove. So thank you. That's for another website, another day, but it's also ultimately about our ability to be resilient. Thanks. Thank you uh, so much. Um... Uh, Nolene for that response, and uh, uh, there's been really some um, excellent uh, responses and feedback also from, from the participants, and I just want to underscore the importance of some of the things that the team has shared around intersectionality and interlinkage and, um, you know, some of the, the strategies and the practical solutions to some of the, the issues that we're addressing. And also, how do we strengthen inclusion uh, and, and climate justice, uh, you know, using some of the tools and lenses that you've shared with us. And from the Pacific Islands Climate Action Network, we've really learned a lot as well from, you know, feminist movements and other movements, uh, indigenous movements across the world. And we've, you know, picked up some of these very useful things that we've uh, incorporated in our work. Um, and, and one of the things that we're doing is how do we bring and strengthen the voices of marginalized groups and vulnerable groups within the climate, climate you know, uh, policy spaces and decision-making spaces. Not often do we see people with disabilities or LGBTQI, indigenous uh, community leaders uh, making direct intervention with our leaders. And, and that's something you know, we are working on. We're developing uh, policy position papers that members can use across the Pacific and you know, we are sitting down, we are talking with people, creating those safe spaces um, so that you know, to enable them to speak up and, and have their voices heard. And uh, I know we are just reached the top of the hour and so I'm going to hand over to Viva um, to uh, lead us to the, to the end and the closing session uh, of this session. Thank you so much. Thank you, Langi. Uh, we are reaching our time of cutoff, we've been reminded. So on behalf of Diva for Equality Fiji, the voice, which is Diverse Voices in Action for Equality Fiji and PKN, we'd like to thank you for tuning in. Thank you for the very constructive uh, conversation and dialogue. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, we have some resources that we can share with you all after this. Um, if you're wishing to please reach us and an email to us to have your hands on these resources. I take this time to thank all the wonderful speakers, uh, Nolene and Bulibo, Francis Tawake and Vika Kalokalo, the technical working group that is really working hard behind the scene, making sure that this session goes well. And also uh, my co moderator Moderator Lavetana uh, Langiseru, thank you for joining us. Uh, I think we've come to the end of our session, and uh, please stay tuned for more uh, work that we'll be sharing. Peter, follow us on Facebook. Uh, we'll all have a, a good afternoon, and hoping for a very productive, uh, Pacific resilient meeting at the end of the week. Thanks, Naka. <laughs> <laughs>